The war god was waiting for us in the diner parking lot. Well, 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 he said. You didn't get yourself killed. You knew it was a trap, I said. Ares gave me a wicked grin. Bet that crippled blacksmith was surprised when he netted a couple of stupid kids. He looked good on TV. I shoved him the shield at him. You're a jerk. Annabeth and Grover caught their breath. Ares grabbed the shield and spun it in air like a pizza dough. It changed form into a melting bulletproof vest. He slid it across the table. See that truck over there? He pointed to an 18-wheeler parked across the street from the diner. That's your ride. Take it straight to L.A. with one stop in Vegas. The 18-wheeler had a sign on the back, which I can only read because it was for reverse printed white on black, a good combination for dyslexia. Kindness International, Humane Zoo Transport, Warning, Live Animals. I said, you're kidding. Harry snapped his fingers. The back door of the truck unlatched. Free ride west, punk. Stop complaining, and here's a little something for doing the job. He stung a blue nylon backpack off his handlebars and tossed it to me. Inside were fresh clothes for all of us, 20 bucks in cash, a pouch full of drachmas, a bag full of double stuff for you. I said, I don't want your a lousy. Thank you, Lord Aries, Grover interrupted, giving me his best red alert warning. Look, thanks a lot. I gritted my teeth. It was probably a deadly insult to refuse something from a god, but I didn't want anything that Aries had touched. Reluctantly, I slung the backpack over my shoulder. I knew it was my anger, which was being caused by the war god's presence, but I still was itching to punch him in the nose. He reminded me of every bully I'd ever faced. Nancy Bowerfit, Clarice, Smelly Gabe, sarcastic teachers, every jerk who called me stupid in school or laughed at me when I'd gotten expelled. I looked back at the diner, which only had a couple of customers now. The waitress who served us dinner was watching nervously out the window, like she was afraid Aries might hurt us. She dragged the fried cook out from the kitchen to see. She said something to him. He nodded, held a little disposable camera, and snapped a picture of us. Great, I thought. We'll make the papers again tomorrow. I imagined the headline, 12-year-old outlaw beats up defenseless biker. You owe me one more thing, I told Aries. Try to keep my voice level. You promised me information about my other, my mother. You sure you can handle the news? He kick-started his motorcycle. She's not dead. The ground seemed to spin beneath me. What do you mean? I mean she was taken away from the Minotaur before she could die. She was turned into a shower of gold, right? That's metamorphosis, not death. She's being kept. Kept why? You need to study war punk hostages. You take somebody to control somebody else. Nobody's controlling me. He left. Oh, yeah? See you around, kid. I balled my fist. You're pretty smug, Lord Aries, for a guy who runs behind Cupid statues. Behind his sunglasses, fire glowed. I felt a hot wind in my hair. We'll meet again, Percy Jackson. Next time you'll, you're in a fight, watch your back. He rubbed his Harley, then roared off down Delancey Street. Annabeth said, that's not smart, Percy. I don't care. You don't want a god as your enemy, especially not that god. Hey, guys, Grover said, I hate to interrupt, but... He pointed towards the diner. At the register, the last two customers were preparing the, their check. Two men identical black coveralls with white logo on their backs that smashed one on the kindness international truck. Before taking the Zoo Express, Grover said, We need to hurry. I didn't like it, but we had no better options. Besides, I'd seen enough of Denver. We ran across the street, climbed into the back of the big rig, closing the doors behind us. The first thing that hit me was the smell. It was like the world's biggest pan of kitty litter. The trailer from the dark inside until I uncapped Ankylosaurus mouse. The blade cast a faint bronze light over a very sad scene. Sitting in a row of filthy metal cages were three of the most pathetic zoo animals I'd not ever beheld. A zebra, a male albino lion, and some weird antelope thing that I didn't know the name for. Someone had thrown the lion in a sack of turnips, which he obviously didn't want to eat. The zebra and the antelope had gotten a styrofoam tray of hamburger meat. The zebra's name was matted with chewing gum. It was like somebody had been spitting on them in their spare time. The antelope had a stupid silver birthday balloon tied on one of his horns that read over the hill. Apparently, nobody had wanted to get close enough to the lion to mess with him, but the poor thing was pacing around on soil blankets in a space that was way too small for him, panting the stuffy heat of the trailer. He had flies buzzing around his pink eyes, and his ribs showed through his white fur. This is kindness, Grover yelled, humane zoo transport. He probably would have gone 
right back outside to beat up the truckers with his reed pipes, and it would have helped him, but then the truck's engine roared to life. The trailer started shaking, and we were forced to sit down or fall down. We huddled into the, some milk, my, mild weed fed snacks, trying to ignore the smell of the heat and the flies. Grover talked to the animals in a series of goat bleeps, but they just stared at him sadly. Annabeth was in favor of breaking the cages and freeing them on the spot, but I pointed out that wouldn't do much good until the truck stopped moving. Besides, I had a feeling we might better look to the lion than those turnips. I found a water jug and refilled their bowls, and then used the ankylosmos to drag the mismatched food out of their cages. I gave the meat to the lion and the turnips to the zebra and the antelope. Grover calmed the antelope down while Annabeth used her knife to cut the balloons off his horn. She wanted to cut the gum out of the zebra's mane too, but we decided that would be too risky without the truck bumping around. We told Grover to promise the animals we'd help them more in the morning when we settled down for night. Grover curled up a turnip sack. Annabeth opened our bag of double stuffed Oreos and nibbled on one half heartily. I tried to cheer myself up by concentrating on the fact that we were halfway to Los Angeles. Halfway to our destination. It was only June 14th. The solstice wasn't until the 21st. We could make it in plenty of time. On the other hand, I had no idea what to expect next. The gods kept toying with me. At least Hephaestus had the decency to be honest about it. He put up cameras and advertised me as entertainment. But when the even cameras weren't rolling, I had the feeling that my quest was being watched. I had a source of amusement from the gods. Hey, Annabeth said. I'm sorry for freaking out back at the water park, Percy. That's okay. It's just, she shuddered, spiders. Because of the Rachne story, I guess, she got turned into a spider for challenging your mom to weaving a contest, right? Annabeth nodded. The Arachne's children have been taking revenge on the children of Athena ever since. There's a spider within a mile of me. It'll find you. I hate the creepy little things. Anyway, I owe you. We're a team, remember, I said. Besides, Grover did the fancy flying. I thought he was asleep. He mumbled the, from the corner. I was pretty amazing, wasn't I? Annabeth and I laughed. She pulled up her Oreo and handed me half. In the iris message, did Luke really say nothing? I munched my cookie and thought about how to answer. The conversation via rainbow had bothered me all evening. Luke said you and he go way back. He also said that Grover wouldn't fail this time. Nobody would turn into a pine tree. The dim bronze light of the sword's blade. It was hard to read their expressions. Grover let out a mournful bray. I should have told you the truth from the beginning. His voice trembled. I thought if you knew I was a failure, you wouldn't bring me along. You were the satire who tried to rescue Thalia and the daughter of Zeus. He nodded grim glumly. And the two other half-bloods Thalia befriended, the ones who got safely to the camp. I looked at Annabeth. That was you and Luke, wasn't it? She put down her Oreo half, half uneaten, like you, Percy. She put down her Oreo uneaten, like you said, Percy. A seven-year-old half-blood wouldn't have made very far alone. Athena guided me toward help. Thalia was twelve. Luke 14. They both run away from home like me. They were happy to take me with them. They were amazing monster fighters, even without training. We traveled from Virginia without any real plans, feeding off monsters for about two weeks before Grover found us. I was supposed to escort Thalia to camp, he said, sniffling. Only Thalia. I had strict orders from Chiron. Don't do anything that would slow down the rescue. We knew Hades was after her, but see, I couldn't leave Luke and Annabeth by themselves. I thought, I thought... I could lead all three of them to safety. It was my fault the kindly ones caught up with us. I froze. I got scared on the way back to camp and took some wrong turns. If I'd just been a little quicker. Stop it, Annabeth said. No one blames you. Thalia didn't blame you either. She sacrificed herself to save us, he said miserably. Her death was my fault. The Council of Cloven Elders said so. Because you wouldn't leave two other half bloods behind, I said. That's not fair. Percy's right, Annabeth said. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you, Grover. Neither would Luke. We don't care what the council says. Grover kept sniffling in the dark. It's just my luck. I'm the lamest satire ever, and I find the two most powerful half-bloods of this century, Thalia and Percy. You're not lame, Annabeth insisted. You've got more courage than any satire I've ever met. Name one other that would dare to go to the underworld. I bet Percy's really glad you're here right now. She kicked me in the shin. Yeah, I said. Which I would have done even without the kick. It's not your luck that you found Leo and me, Grover. 
You've got the biggest heart of satire ever. You're a natural searcher. That's why you'll be the one who finds Pan. I heard a deep, satisfied sigh. I waited for Grover to say something, but his breathing only got heavier. When the sound turned to snoring, I realized he'd fallen asleep. How does he do that? I marveled. I don't know, how Annabeth said, but that was really a nice thing you told him. I mean it. We rode in silence for a few miles, bumping around on the feed sacks. The zebra munched to turn up. The lion licked the last of the hamburger meat off his lips and looked at me hopefully. Annabeth rubbed her necklace like she was thinking deep strategic thoughts. That pine tree bed, bead, I said, is that your first year? She looked at me. She hadn't realized what she was doing. Yeah, she said every August the counselors pick the most important event of the summer. They painted on that year's beads. I've got the latest pine tree, a Greek terame on fire, a centaur and a pond dust. Now that was a weird summer. And the college ring is your father's? That's none of yours. She stopped herself. Yeah, yeah, it is. You don't have to tell me. No, it's okay. She took a shaky breath. My dad sent it to me, folded up a letter two summers ago. The ring was like his main keepsake from Athena. He wouldn't have gotten through his doctoral program at Har Harvard without her. That's a long story. Anyway, he said he wanted me to have it. He apologized for being a jerk and said he loved me and missed me. He wanted me to come home and live with him. That doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, well, the problem was I believed him. I tried to go home from that school year, but my stepmom was the same as ever. She didn't want her kids to be put in danger with a freak. She didn't want her kids put in danger by living with a freak. Monsters attack. We argued. Monsters attack. We argued. I didn't even make it through winter break. I called Chiron, and he came right back to Camp Blood. Camp Half Blood. You'll think you'll ever try living with your dad again? She wouldn't meet my eyes. Please, I'm not into, into self-afflicted pain. You shouldn't give up, I told her. You should write him a letter or something. Thanks for the advice, she said coldly. But my father's made his choice about who he wants to live with. We passed another few miles of silence. So if the gods fight, I said, will things line up the way they did with the Trojan War? Will Athena, it be Athena versus Poseidon? She put her head against the backpack Ares had given us and closed her eyes. I don't know what my mom will do. I just know I'll fight next to you. Why? Because you're my friend, seaweed brain. Any more stupid questions? I couldn't think of an answer for that. Fortunately, I didn't have to, and Beth was asleep. I had trouble following her example with Grover snoring and an albino lion staring hungrily at me, but eventually I closed my eyes. The nightmare started out, something I dreamed a million times before. I was being forced to take a standardized test while wearing a straitjacket. All the other kids were going out to recess. The teacher kept saying, Come on, Percy. You're not stupid, are you? Pick up your pencil. The dream strayed from the usual. I looked over at the next desk and saw a girl sitting there, also wearing a straight jacket. She was my age, with unruly black punk-style hair, with dark eyeliner around her stormy green eyes, and freckles around her nose. Somehow I knew she was. Thalia, daughter of Zeus. She struggled against the straight jacket, glared at me in frustration, and said, Well, seaweed brain... One of us has to get out of here. She's right, my dream self thought. I'm going to pack back to that cavern. I'm going to give Kate Hades a piece of my mind. The straight jacket melted off me. I felt the classroom floor. The teacher's voice changed until it was cold and evil, echoing the depths of a great chasm. Percy Jackson had said, Yes, the exchange went well, I see. I was back in the dark cavern, spirits of the dead drifting around me. Unseen the pit, the monstrous thing was speaking. But this time it wasn't addressing me. The numbing power of its voice seemed directed somewhere else. And he suspects nothing, I said. Another voice, one I recognized, answering at my shoulder. Nothing, my lord. He's as ignorant as the rest. I looked over, but nobody was there. The speaker was invisible. Deception upon deception, the thing in the pit needs to love. Excellent. Truly, my lord, the voice next to me. You are well named the crooked one, but was it really necessary? I could have brought you what I stole directly. You, the monster said in scorn, have already shown your limits. You would have failed me completely had I not intervened. But my lord, peace, my little servant. Our six months have brought us. Zeus's anger has grown. Poseidon has played his most desperate card. And now we shall use it against him. Shortly you shall have the reward you wish in your revenge. As soon as both items are delivered into my hands. But wait, he is here. What? The invisible servant suddenly sounded tense. He summoned my lord. No, the full force 
The monster's attention was now pouring over me, freezing me in place, blast his father's blood. He's too changeful, too unpredictable. What? The invisible servant suddenly surrounded the tent. He summoned him, my lord, no. The full force monster's attention was now pouring over me, freezing me in my place. Blast his father's blood. He too changeable, too unpredictable. The boy brought himself hither. Impossible, the servant cried. For a weakling such as you, perhaps, a voice marled. Then its cold power turned back on me. So you wish to dream of your cost, young half-blood, then I shall oblige. The scene changed. I was standing. Standing in the vast throne with black marble walls and bronze floors, the empty horrid throne was made from human bones fused together. Standing at the foot of the dais was my mother, shimmering in golden light, her arms outstretched. I tried to step toward her, but my legs wouldn't move. I reached for her, only to realize that my hands were withering to bones. Grinning skeletons in Greek armor crowded around me, draping me with silk ropes. Breathing my head with laurels, with smoke that chimera poison burning into my skull. The evil voice began to laugh. Hail the conquering hero. I woke with a start. Grover was shaking my shoulder. The truck stopped. He said, We think they're coming to check on the animals. Hide, Annabeth hissed. She had it easy. She put on her magic cap and disappeared. Grover and I had to dive behind feed sacks. We hoped we looked like turnips. The trailer doors creaked open. Sunlight and heat poured in. Man, one of the truckers said, waving his hand in front of his ugly nose. I wish I hauled appliances. He climbed inside and poured some water from a jug into the animal dishes. You hot, big boy? He asked the lion, then splashed the rest of the bucket on the lion's face. The lion roared in indignation. Yeah, 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 the man said. Next to me under the turnip sacks were over tents. For a peace-loving herbivore, he looked downright murderous. The trucker threw the antelope in a squashed looking happy meal bag. He smirked at the zero How you doing, Stripes? This will be getting rid of you. This up. You like magic shows? You're going to love this one. They're going to saw you in half. The zebra wild eyed with fierce looked straight at me. There was no sound but as clear as day I heard it say, Free me, Lord, please. I was too stunned to react. There was a loud knock, knock, knock on the side of the trailer. The trucker inside with us yelled, what do you want, Eddie? A voice outside, it must have been Eddie, shouted, Maurice, what'd you say? What are you banging for? Knock, knock, knock. Outside, Eddie yelled, What banging? Our guy, Maurice, rolled his eyes and went back outside, cursing at Eddie for being an idiot. A second later, Annabeth appeared next to me. She must have done the banging to get Maurice out of the trailer. She said, This transport business can't be legal. No kidding, Grover said. He paused as if listening. The lion says these guys are animal smugglers. That's right, the zebra's voice said in my mind. We've got to free them, Grover said. He and Annabeth looked at me as if waiting for my lead. I'd heard the zebra talk, but not the lion. Why? Maybe it was another learning disability. I could only understand zebras. Then I thought horses. What had Annabeth said about Poseidon creating horses? Was the zebra close enough to a horse? Is that why I could understand it? The zebra said, open my cage, Lord, please. I'll be fine after that. Outside, Eddie and Maurice were still yelling at each other, but I knew they'd be coming inside to torment the animals once again. I grabbed Riptide and slashed the lock off the zebra's cage. The zebra burst out. It turned to me and bowed. Thank you, Lord. Grover held up his hands and said something to the zebra and goat talk like a blessing. Just as Maurice was poking his head back in to check out the noise, the zebra leaped over and into the street. There was yelling and screaming and cars honking. We rushed to the doors in the trailer in time to see the zebra galloping down a wide boulevard lined with hotels and casinos and neon signs. We just released a zebra in Las Vegas. Maurice and Eddie ran after it, with a few policemen running after them shouting, Hey, you need a permit for that. Now would be a good time to leave, Annabeth said. The other animals first, Grover said. I cut the locks off with my sword. Grover raised his hands and spoke some goat blessing he used for the zebra. Good luck, I told the animals. The antelope and the lion burst out of their cage and went off together in the street. Some tourists screamed. Most backed off and took pictures, probably thinking it was some kind of stunt of one of the casinos. Will the animals be okay? I asked Grover. I mean, the desert and all? Don't worry, he said. I placed a satire sanctuary on them, meaning... They'll reach the wild safely, he said. They'll find water, food, or water, food, 
food, shade, whatever they need until they find a safe place to live. Why can't you place the blessing like that on us, I asked. It only works on wild animals. So it would only affect Percy and about the reason. Hey, I protested. Kidding, she said. Come on, let's get out of this filthy truck. We stumbled out up into the desert afternoon. It was at like 110 degrees easy. We must have looked like deep fried vagrants, but everyone was too interested in the wild animals to pay us any more attention. We passed the Monte Carlo and the MGM. We passed the pyramids, a pirate ship, a Statue of Liberty, which is a pretty small replica, but it still made me homesick. I wasn't sure what we were looking for. Maybe just a place to get out of the heat for a few minutes? Find a sandwich, a glass, of lemonade, make a new plan for getting west. We must have taken a wrong turn because we found ourselves at a dead end standing in front of the Lotus Hotel and Casino. The entrance was a huge neon flower and petals lighting up and blinking. No one was going in or out, but the glittering chrome doors were open, spilling out air conditioning that smelled like flowers. Lotus blossom, maybe. I've never smelled one, so I wasn't sure. The doorman smiled at us. Hey, kids, you look tired. You want to come in and sit down? I learned to be suspicious the last week or so, so I figured anybody might be a monster or god. You just couldn't tell. But this guy was normal. Just one look at him I could see. Besides, I was so relieved to hear somebody who sounded sympathetic that I nodded and we'd love to come inside. Inside, we took one look around and Grover said, Whoa! The whole lobby was a giant game room, and I'm not talking about cheesy old Pac-Man games or slot machines. There was an indoor water slide snaking around the glass elevator, which went straight up at least 40 floors. There was a climbing wall on one side of the building and an indoor bungee jumping bridge. There was... Virtual reality suits with working laser guns and hundreds of video games, each the size of a widescreen TV. Basically, you name it, this place had it. There were a few other kids playing, but not many. No waiting for the games. There were waitresses and snack bars all around, serving every kind of food you can imagine. Hey, a bellhop said. At least I guessed he was a bellhop. He wore a white and yellow Hawaiian shirt with lotus design shorts and flip-flops. Welcome to the Lowe's Casino. Here's your room key. I stammered, um, but... No, no, he said laughing. The bill's taken care of. No extra charges, no tips. Just go up on the top floor. Room 401. 4001. If you need anything like extra bubbles for the hot tub or skeet target for the shooting range or whatever, just call the front desk. Here are your Lotus cash cards. They work in restaurants and all the games and the rides. He handed each of us a green plastic credit card. I knew it must be a mistake. Obviously, he thought we were some millionaires. Kids, but I took the card and said, How much is on here? His eyebrows knit together. What do you mean? I mean, does it run out of cash? He left. Oh, you're making a joke. Hey, that's cool. Enjoy your stay. We took the elevator upstairs and checked out our room. It was a suite with three separate bedrooms and a bar stocked with candy, sodas, and chips. A hotline to room service, fluffy towels and water beds with feather pillows. A big screen television with satellite and high speed internet. The balcony had its own hot tub and sure enough there was a skeet shooting machine and a shotgun so you could play launch clay pigeons right out, out there over the Vegas skyline and plug them with your gun. I didn't see how that could be legal, but I thought it was pretty cool. The view over the strip in the desert were amazing. Though I doubted We'll ever find time to look at the view with a room like this. Oh, goodness, Annabeth said, this place is sweet, Grover said, absolutely sweet. They were clothes in the closet, and they fit me, and I frowned, thinking this was a little strange. I threw Aries' backpack in the trash can. Wouldn't need that anymore when we left. I could just charge a new one to the hotel store. I took a shower, which felt awesome after a week of grimy travel. I changed clothes ate a bag of chips, drank three Cokes, and came up feeling better than I had in a long time. In the back of my mind, some small problem kept nagging me. I'd had a dream or something. I needed to talk to my friends, but I wasn't sure it could wait. I came out of the bedroom and found Annabeth and Grover had also showered and changed clothes. Grover was eating potato chips to his heart's content while Annabeth cranked up the National Geographic channel. All those stations, I told her, and you turn on National Geographic, are you insane? It's interesting. I feel gro good, Grover said. I love this place. Without even realizing it, the wings sprouted out of his shoes.
shoes and lift him a foot off the ground and back down again. So what now, Annabeth? I asked sleep. Grover and I looked at each other. We both held up our green little lotus cash cards. Playtime, I said. I couldn't remember the last time I had so much fun. I came from a relatively poor family. Our idea of a splurge was eating out at Burger King and renting a video. A five-star Vegas hotel? Forget it. I bungee jumped the lobby five or six times, did the water slide, snowboarded the artificial ski slope, and played a virtual reality laser tag in an FBI sharpshooter. I sucked over a few times going from game to game. He really liked the reverse hunter thing where the deer go out and shoot their rednecks. I saw Annabeth playing trivia games and some other brainiac stuff. They had this huge 3D sim game where you could build your own city and you could actually see the holographic buildings rising on the display board. I didn't think much of it, but Annabeth loved it. I'm shot, not sure when I first realized something was wrong. Probably it was when I noticed the guy standing next to me at the VR sharpshooters. He's about 13, I guess, but his clothes were weird. I thought he was some Elvis impersonator, son. He wore bell-bottom jeans and a red t-shirt with black piping. And his hair was permed and gelled like a New Jersey girl's on a homecoming night. We played a game of sharpshooters together, and he said, Groovy, man. Been here two weeks, and the games keep getting better and better. Groovy? Later on, while we were talking, I said something was sick, and he looked at me kind of startled if he'd never heard the word used before. He said his name was Darren, but as soon as I started asking him questions, he got bored with me and started to go back to the computer screen. I said, Hey, Darren. What? What year is it? He frowned at me. In the game. No, in real life. He had to think about it. 1977? No, I said, getting a little scared. Really? Hey, man. Bad vibes. I got a game happening. After that, he totally ignored me. I started talking to people, and I found it wasn't easy. They were glued to the TV screen or the video game or their food or whatever. I found a guy who told me it was 1985. Another told me it was 1993. They all claimed they hadn't been there a very long time. A few days, a few weeks at most. They really didn't know or care. It occurred to me how long had I been here. It seemed like only a couple hours, but was it? I tried to remember why we were here. We were going to Los Angeles. We were supposed to find the entrance to the underworld. My mother, for a scary second. I had trouble remembering her name. Sally. Sally Jackson. I had to find her. I had to stop Hayes from causing World War III. I found Annabeth still building her city. Come on, I told her. We've got to get out of here. No response. I shook her. Annabeth? She looked up annoyed. What? We need to leave. Leave? What are you talking about? I've just got to the towers. This place is a trap. She didn't listen to me. She didn't respond until I shook her head. What? Listen, the underworld, our quest. Oh, come on, Percy. Just a few more minutes. Annabeth, there are people here from 1977. Kids who have never aged. You check in and you stay forever. So, she asked, can you imagine a better place? I grabbed her wrist and yanked her away from the game. Hey, she screamed and hit me, but nobody else even bothered looking at us. They were too busy. I made her look directly in my eyes. I said, spider, large, huge, hairy spiders. That jarred her. Her vision was cleared. Oh, my God, she said. How long have we? I don't know, but we've got to find Grover. We were searching him. found him still playing virtual deer hunter. Grover, we both shouted. He said, die, human, die, die, silly, polluting, nasty person. Grover. He turned the plastic gun on me, and it started clicking. As if I were just another image from the screen. I looked at Annabeth, and together we took Grover by the arms and dragged him away. His flying shoes sprang to life and started tugging his legs in the other direction as he shouted, No! I just got to new level! No! The Lotus Alhop hurried us up to us. Well, now are you ready for the platinum cards? We're leaving, I told him. Such a shame, he said, and I got the feeling that he really meant it, that we were breaking his heart if we went. We had an entire new floor of full games for platinum card members. He held up the cards and I wanted one. I knew that if I took one, I'd never leave. I stay here, happy forever, playing games forever. I'd soon forget about my mom and my quest and maybe my even my own name. I'd be playing Virtual Rifle Man with Groovy Disco Darren forever. Grover reached for the card, but Annabeth yanked back his arm and said, No thanks. We walked towards the door, and as we did, the smell of the food and the sounds in the game seemed to get more and more inviting. I thought about our room upstairs. 
We could stay the night, sleep in bed for once. Then we bust through the doors of the Lotus Casino and ran down to the sidewalk. It felt like afternoon, but at the same time of day we've got into the casino, but something was wrong. The weather had changed. It was stormy with heat lightning flashing out in the desert. Aries' backpack was slung over my shoulder, which was odd because I was sure I'd thrown it into the trash can in room 4001. But at the moment I had other problems to write about. I ran to the nearest newspaper stand and read the year first. Thank the gods it was the same year it had been when we went in. I noticed the date, June 20th. We had been at the Lotus Casino for five days? We had only one day left until the summer solstice, one day to complete our quest.